Your Creative Push, Episode 310. The best time to plant an oak tree uh, was 40 years ago. But the next best time is as soon as you get home. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Joshua LaRock. Josh is a figurative artist who uses classical realism to make some of the most stunning paintings that I have ever seen. They are incredibly beautiful and very realistic, and he is also one of the kindest and most thoughtful people that I've talked to in a long time. And he comes on the show today to talk about his initial interest and study of music and music business and how he became aware of classical realism and his discovery of John Singer Sargent, Jacob Collins, and Ark. He also talks about the common experience that he shared with other artists of being an artist that didn't start from a young age. Joshua also talks about controlling his anxiety during quick sketches in his first portrait of his wife, Laura, and what made that particular portrait special. Joshua also shares his opinion that you only need to do one good painting for people to take interest in you, and he gives his advice for making decisions or putting yourself in the position to have to make decisions. Josh also dives into the topic of what it feels like for artists to take on that additional title of entrepreneur, and he gives a great example from Michelangelo. Josh also shares his take on how soon artists should consider teaching others, and he also shares how to push past imposter syndrome, one of the most difficult things that we are still trying to uh, tackle in this, the 310th edition of Your Creative Push. But like I said, Josh is a very thoughtful and kind guest, and I loved speaking with him today about his creative process and how you can push past some of your creative resistances as well. So please sit back, enjoy, and be inspired by my conversation with Joshua LaRock. Joshua, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thanks, young man. Happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you, my friend. I always like to give my guests the opportunity at the the beginning to kind of give us a brief overview of sort of how you got to the point you are today, creatively speaking. Sure. Uh, Well, you know, it's it's kind of a – I sort of stumbled around uh, quite a bit, um, stumbled my way into this. I, You know, I kind of always had a relatively creative inclination. It was just kind of trying to find the right path for that. So I went to to college for – I started as a musician – I did uh, uh, percussion, and then I picked up the classical guitar. I did that for a little while. And uh, somewhere along the line, I figured out that being a performer wasn't, wasn't for me, just wasn't my, uh, wasn't my calling. And so then I transferred that, all of those kinds of credits into music business. So I figured I could still kind of be in the, uh, be in the you know, creative field, but, um, you know, be involved. But so um, I was interning at a bunch of uh, uh, you know music industry type fields. I interned at a, a, a record label, a radio station, management company, and uh, you know at the end of the day, it was just the, the perks wore off for me uh, in terms of uh, you know the creativity that I was I was a part of. It was it was a lot of phone calls, a lot of a lot of emails and things. So um, I kind of decided that wasn't for me and. It was around this time, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia at the time, that I had discovered uh, this type of painting that, that I now do, which you could, some people call it classical realism. Um, basically, it's oil painting in you know, a traditional sense, so highly based in uh, drawing and painting the figure. Um, I, I just wasn't, up to this point, I wasn't aware that, that people still did this. I, I just I had no concept of it. I had taken some art classes in college. But they um, they were more like survey courses. They weren't technically based. And I didn't even know what I wanted. I just decided that, that wasn't for me at the time. So anyway, so I found I found on the internet, just kind of searching around, I found this guy's work named John Singer Sargent. He was just a, uh, you know, you're probably aware of him, but he, you know, so he was a giant in the 19th century in terms of portraiture. And he's still relatively well known, um, you know, lots of his stuff throughout the museums. But I hadn't heard of him really, or I didn't know him by name. I was just Googling. I was trying to figure out about his life. How did he do this? Where did he study? And I came across this word atelier, which is basically just the French word for studio. I took that word. I, I popped it in Google, um, trying to figure out what it was. 
that took me to uh, a site called the Art Renewal Center. And uh, basically, it's this organization that was set up to, um, well, I mean, you know, like the name says, they, they, they think there should be this renewal in art, or at least this, this revival of this kind of um, traditional uh, painting. So uh, they had this list of schools or ateliers that were kind of starting to, to emerge uh, in the country. There's quite a few in Italy. And, you know, so I was just, I, I just was stumbling forward. I didn't know what I was doing. I, it was just through that, that internet search that I found that these things were, were even there. So I was on the East Coast and I visited three on the East Coast, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, and then one in, um, one in North Carolina. So I just decided that, you know, I'm going to give this a shot and, and see where it goes. But I really didn't know. I mean, I was, I was a pretty idealistic kid at the time. I mean, I, I, I still am, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to go to this school for a couple of months and then, uh, you know, sort of go off and then join the Peace Corps or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but so I, you know, I was, I was 20, I was 23. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of obligations or responsibility. And, but I moved to New York to study with this guy named Jacob Collins um, in his sort of small studio and, uh, and just clicked, you know, it was a very intimate environment. So it wasn't like another, another degree program. It was, uh, it was him in his studio in his home and about 15 other students. And it was just very intensely technical based. So we just, you, you know, you go in there, it's not any lectures or anything like that. Those are kind of maybe peppered throughout the, the course of study over a number of years. But really, it's you just, you get there and you, and you draw a, a cast, a plaster cast, which is just a fragment of a sculpture. Um, often we start with, the features of Michelangelo's David and you're just drawing. So no painting to begin. And then, um, and then figure drawing in the afternoon. So the, the, the course was just very methodical, very technically based and, and, you know, to sort of make a long story short, I stayed there for three years and uh, sort of saw my, whatever latent kind of abilities I had just start to blossom and, and, uh, and then I stayed in New York for another seven years. I, I was, I started teaching, uh, shortly thereafter. And so it just kind of grew, but you know, I, it, there wasn't some grand plan. I was just kind of taking one step and kind of seeing where that led me. If that makes sense. The good old learning by doing, <laughs> you know, yeah. not, not having like two years of lectures before you even like touch a paintbrush or yeah. touch a pencil. Like, right. I think it's so important for people to remember that, like to not have that like paralysis by analysis and just yeah. literally start and just pick it up that way, figure out what you need to know and just like ha- have fun with it as well. It's really true. Yeah. Yeah. What was that initial experience like of, you know, you, you go on this Google adventure, you want to know mm. what an atelier is <laughs> and yeah. then suddenly you're, you know, you find yourself, uh, starting um what was what was that initial experience like as you said 23 years old yeah what a testament because you were one of the greatest artists i've ever uh laid my eyes on oh, and thanks. uh yeah absolutely man and so i kind of expected your story like i didn't know anything about your story and i kind of expected yeah. you to have you know started when you were four <laughs> so you know what a testament to just discovering you know dabbling in other things and then um, not having that paralysis uh, yeah. of, of realizing that, oh, I, you know, it's too late for me to start doing this right. um, and just achieving greatness. So what was that kind of initial experience like? Um, did you kind of have the skills right when you started um, and what kept you motivated? No, not at all. I mean, um, it was it was exciting. It was uh, it was scary. I mean, I, I had been to New York before, but not much. I, I showed up with with two duffel bags and uh, rented an apartment that I hadn't seen. And, you know, I mean, and some of that's just like stage of life like where I could do that, you know, I could, I could live kind of scrappy and, and do it. But yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's really one of those things you just, you just got to dive in. I, I have a friend now who says, um, you, if the door opens, you walk through it and if it doesn't kill you, you, you just keep going, <laughs> mm, you know? And so, so uh, I think looking back on it, there, there was some of that in what I was doing, but, uh, you know, Skills can really be learned um, at, at any time. We one of the, one of the things I enjoyed about where I studied is there were you know my story was relatively common. Most people had kind of found it after after college. Hmm. Um, my instructor Jacob, he was always trying to kind of get people younger and younger because of course that would have been that would be good. That would have right. been, it would have been <laughs> nice to have 
have entered this course of study when, you know, when I was in my teens or something like that. Um, and of course, that's how it used to be. You know, Sargent himself, he was, he was, he was drawing and painting from a very young age. But no, I mean, that, you know, it's always possible. I was just lucky to have found a, a, a way of, you know, his, his method of instruction that really made sense to me. Um, and then I think that was kind of what unlocked a lot of maybe whatever is, is, you know, innately there. I, I do always tell people that I think art and painting, so much of it can be learned because it really, you know, it really is a lot of math and science, geometry, things like that. Um, there's definitely the poetic side. There's definitely a certain element of talent, but I think, I think people assume that it's something you either can or you can't do. But it's funny because I don't think we do that with other disciplines sometimes. Oh, yeah. With with music, you know, people assume that there's a much higher base level of just like common ability people can have because you can you can learn the technical aspects of reading music, playing an instrument, you know, or any other any other skill. But sometimes it feels like with art, it's you know either you can draw or you can't. But it takes a lot of practice, and a lot of people can learn a lot. I mean, that's definitely something I've I've seen even as an instructor. Uh, after studying myself. I totally agree. I think that uh, people, they say, oh, I can't draw or I can't, mm. I have no artistic skills. But like, honestly, how much effort have you put into it? Have you put even mo- more than one hour <laughs> trying to, yeah. you know, do anything past stick figures? Um, right. And yeah, there is that hesitancy then to to suck at something, to, to start <laughs> something and be terrible at it. Would yeah. you have any advice for somebody like that? Well, that's a very real factor. Um, and I think I, I really remember that we would do these when I was studying, we would do these quick sketches. Most of what we, most of the training was these really long form drawings where you would spend, um, four hours a day over the course of several weeks on, on this one drawing, just so that you could really, you know, you had to chew on something longer than you wanted to, to Mm -hmm. learn this, this idea of making, um, making the, the illusion of three dimensions. But once a week, we would then do these these quick sketches where it was a, uh, a painted portrait sketch in oils in the course of about four hours, which is, uh, uh, that's not enough time, you know, in a lot of ways. And I would just remember having to learn how to control my anxiety in during during those sessions, you know, because there's so much to do. You've got you to figure out the drawing, you've got to get the expression, you've got to get the likeness, and you've got to figure out how to get the color. So there's just, there's a lot of things that you're juggling all at once. And the times when I could just take a deep breath and, you know, take one step forward in this particular painting, um, it would get better. They weren't always amazing. Um, but then the other times when the anxiety would just kind of snowball, then it would, of course, you know, the drawing would kind of, or the painting would go downhill. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but so that's a learned skill like anything else. You know, I remember that. I remember having to kind of just give myself the pep talk during these sessions the more it works, the more you are able to give into that, give into, well, let go of the anxiety is what I mean. And, and just sort of give into the process of, okay, well, I know how to do this part. I know how to do this part. So, you know, I get it. I resonate with, with that fear. And my best advice there is to just take a deep breath and, and, and go for it, you know, um, try to put it aside as well as you can. So. Right. Like we said, learning, learning by doing, learning by experience. And the only way to get past those like uh, scary middle parts or those difficult parts is to get through it over and over again before yeah. trust that, oh, okay, I've done this. I've been here. <laughs> I know yeah. this could feel icky, um, but uh, it, we survive like going through that open door. Just keep going. <laughs> Most definitely. I know how much planning goes into your your paintings, your your pieces of work. Mm. Um, do you ever find that you get to a point though where it's just not right? It's not the right fit for whatever reason. Uh, best laid plans. It still just doesn't feel right, and you scrap it. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I it's every painting kind of goes through this um, this cycle for me where you know, it, it, there's the initial excitement of, of a new idea and kind of getting it down. But then there's this inertia of just having to kind of get all of the administrative ducks in a row to, for me, it's either hiring a model or going out and doing a sketch of like of the environment that they're going to be in or whatever. And that, that, that's always a, a really tough time, but there's always a point at which I think this is not going to work, <laughs> you know, it, it needs painting. And, um, 
you know, I, there, there are certain tricks that I do to kind of try to mitigate that. But yeah, you know, the, the failures are, I guess, fewer the, than the successes. And, you know, I, I do try to finish everything uh, just kind of like as a course of habit. And I think that there's just something good about that, you know, because if you allow yourself to not finish, then there's, there could be a whole bunch of unfinished paintings around the studio. But, you know, and if it, if you finish it and then it just doesn't work or, you know, it doesn't sell and just, uh, you know, you move on and, and try to learn from it and move forward. I mean, I'm, I'm always trying to, to figure out how to make a painting more successful, but it's a battle. I mean, there are points where it's just, you know, you, you kind of need to take it off the easel and put it up against the wall and not look at it for several months and then pick it back up. And I don't know, you scrub a different color in the background and all of a sudden this thing that just wasn't working, um, all of a sudden it takes on new life. Yeah. Getting a distance from, from something, especially how long does it take for most of like on average for your pieces? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, you know, I get asked that a lot and it's so hard because I probably should keep track of it more, more often, but uh, maybe, maybe I I would be too, uh, that would be sort of a depressing thing to keep track of all the hours (laughs) that go into something, but (laughs) it's better. um, Ignorance is bliss sometimes. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah. No, but I, you know, each painting, uh, depending on the size and complexity, they're, they're, they're probably on the easel for a month or two, but that's not, that doesn't mean that I'm working on this one painting for 40 hours a week or something because I've got few, a few paintings going at the same time or, and or, you know, then I have to do the various uh, other things that go along with art making, answering emails, um, packing and shipping, ordering paints, you know, stuff like that. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of a general average, uh, but some are on there much longer, others much shorter. Yeah. So then it is very necessary then to sometimes, you know, turn it away from you <laughs> to kind of break up with it <laughs> for, yes. for a period of time. See, and then yeah. come back with that fresh set of eyes or yeah. just distant eyes, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. But I do find that the things are generally more successful the more planning I do. I always kind of regret that at the end. That, um, I'm kind of working my, my way out of problems in the midst of the final painting where, whereas I always feel like if I had just planned this out a little bit more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe I could have avoided some of that, but kind of going along with the theme of, of your work, um, you have this one very special piece um, called, uh, it's just called Laura. It's, it's a portrait of your wife. Mm. Well, I've done several, which, yeah. uh, the one that was, um, in a- Aquapal, is that mm. how you say it? Yes. Um, well, was, yeah, sort of, it's a strange I, like, acronym. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, could you talk about that one? Because I, I don't know if I, I would assume that you would agree that it's a special piece because it just, I don't know, it has like that kind of Mona Lisa feel to it, like where mm-hmm. it's just right. <laughs> um, Thank you. so yeah. could you talk about that process and at what point did you know that this was something special? Sure. Um, well, that was the first painting I've, uh, uh I did of my wife, Flora. Um, I've since probably done, I painted her. Uh, three or four more times. And that was one of the first pieces I did actually after leaving my studies uh, with Jacob. I was really just trying to figure out now how do I how do I use my this technical facility, this technical ability that I've got ever you know um, I've earned and now make a painting. How do I make something poetic, something beautiful, something that resonates with people who uh, the you know viewers who aren't as excited or knowledgeable or whatever about the technical size of things you know so many times as a painter i look at the at the at a painting from a technical standpoint but um you know i've certainly learned that that my viewers they're they're interested in the emotional content of what the piece is you know whatever that that hook is so so that's what i was kind of trying to figure out it took a long time Uh, i've i've gotten quite a lot faster since then but I was just trying to be as conscientious as I could to, um, you know, the, the fall of light. I was painting it from natural light, um, which was new for me when we studied. We were always painting from indoor artificial lighting. And, um, and I was also looking at a, a painter named uh, William Bouguereau at that time. Um, he was, he was a, a, another giant in the 19th century in France. And he just had this particular way of painting flesh that was just so, uh, beautiful, bright and colorful and, and, um, and full of life. So 
I was I was looking at a painting of his that had a similar very similar pose. And I was so I was looking at my wife who was sitting there for me and then looking at this painting and trying to figure out, okay, what what are the decisions that I make to um to to make a you know a true work of art? And and so that was what that was what I was doing the entire time that I was making that. And then the painting was finished and I was happy with it, uh definitely from a drawing standpoint and a sort of a technical standpoint. But then what would happen is people would see it and, and also people who knew my wife, they could sense something in that. And they, so the feedback that I would get is that they could, they could see my, you know, our relationship in that. They could mm. see something of, you know, her personality, something of, you know, my love for her, and which, I, which was really rewarding. And it, it was interesting because it wasn't something I had consciously tried to do, if that makes sense. It's that, mm-hmm. it's that ineffable kind of quality of of art that uh, I don't know if you can try to do it if you just you just have to be kind of present and and open to the to your subject and I guess that somehow the 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 emotion gets um, gets put into that so so it's interesting and I and I was was, uh, excited to hear that and so that that painting um, got a fair amount of uh, I guess attention for lack of a better word and you know and I always and I, I like to tell people that that you know, you really just have to do like one really good painting <laughs> and <laughs> that can really just, you know, you'll get an audience, you know, people will, people will take a, uh, take a look. So anyway, that was that one for me. That was sort of my first kind of early success. And, uh, I was really you know delighted that, that people had that, that reaction with it because that's what you hope for. Right. So, yeah. Well, and you talk a little bit about, you talked about decisions and like deciding to use natural light and just really mm. critically thinking about it as you're creating it. I mm. wonder, do you have any advice for uh, really any creative person about making decisions? Because I think especially when, when people get experience and they have, you know, some successes, they might fall into patterns. They might do mm. the same kind of thing over and over again, make the same sort of decisions. So would you have any advice for um, putting yourself in a situation maybe to have to make a decision <laughs> to change mm. things up? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure it out always, you mm. know, with each painting. It's, it's what was the, you know, confluence of things that came together to make that a success. Um, Cause it's not like you can kind of just check boxes uh, there are things, there's certainly principles that make a uh, painting m- more successful than another. I guess what I try to do is just be genuine uh, as much as I can toward the subject. I think that those are the ones that always seem to have the most resonance or the ones, the paintings that I create that seem to have the most resonance with others are the ones where I just, I'm genuinely excited about the idea, the lighting, the uh, the emotion, and somehow that that comes through and that's not always easy to do i mean you you there are days like anything else where you kind of just have to show up to work and get get going i I mean i think there's it's a it's a famous quote or something where you know inspiration has to find you working and and i think that's true you know i think that's really true but you know so you, you just kind of start along the process and then i find that i'll get excited about something but uh so to just to just be present, to be genuine about the the thing that you love, um, and sometimes somehow that'll that'll make it into the into the pigments on the canvas. I don't know. Absolutely, yeah. And you talked a little bit about your kind of stint with music, uh, mm. you know, trying things out and then getting into music as kind of a business. Do have some of those uh, traits uh, business wise? transferred over to um your painting because i know that a lot of Mm -hmm. artists feel icky when it comes to selling work or you know having that mindset that entrepreneurial mindset of um, what it takes to be an artist and i think it's an an important aspect of it um the the whole administrative thing and promoting yourself and selling work and all that stuff Um, so did some of those skills transfer over uh, most definitely though. I, you know, I will say I kind of went through a season where <laughs> I, uh, I think I forgot about them and, and I kind of entered into that, just what you, what you said, this, it was a surprise to me that I was, uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Hmm. You know, I, I, I just, I went to study and, and kept doing it because I loved it. 
and it, it, it kind of dawned on me after the fact that I was a business owner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, <laughs> Oops. You know, I mean, yeah. So it's it's tough. I mean, it's um, but it is very real. And I've you know, I think I've uh, I've retaken up that task uh, in recent years, and and it's been really helpful. But you know, it's just, it's such a weird myth. I don't know where that happened over the course of this. You know, there was a lot of things that happened in sort of the history of the 20th century and, and what it means to be the quote unquote artist. But, you know, a lot of the guys who we revere and love, they were they were very smart business people. You know, at least in, in, in my field, they're, we, you know, they're often referred to as the old masters. But I love to talk about how you know, Michelangelo, he uh, didn't initially want to do the Sistine Chapel. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he nah. he did that as a, um, you know, as a commission to lead to the, the this funeral sculpture commission that he actually wanted. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, then he threw himself into it. Obviously, it's, it's the thing he's most well known for. And it took him four years. And, and But he was, he considered himself more of a sculptor than a painter. And um, anyway, so he's, you know, he's he was a business person. And, and you can see that in any, in any other um, artist you bring up. So... I don't think that there's this, you know, it's a false dichotomy between the artist and the poet and the business person. So marketing can be useful. Marketing at its best is building trust with, with your, you know, your clients or your viewers, you know, it's not trying to be um, <clears throat> manipulative or uh, whatever the thing that might cause us to hesitate. And so I've, you know, I've, taken hold of that. And I think that it's been good. Building relationships, like any other successful business, uh, building relationships is key. Um, building awareness, building a brand. Those things are, those things are all very helpful. And those, those were all, you know, in the music, uh, in the music business, things I learned in the music business, um, looking back on it. So, uh, I, I'd, I'd highly encourage, uh, anybody who's, you know, wanting to pursue art and things don't, don't uh, don't be hesitant about uh, um, you know taking hold of the business aspects of things. So, and have you found that you've had similar experiences to that to that Michelangelo story of you know taking up a commission maybe and uh, either it being a, a profound work, something that you're really proud of, or perhaps learning something new or it leading to something new? Sure. I mean, I think you know there's always a um, you know a little bit of a dance between. Um, things that you're, that you're really passionate about and, and, um, you know, the, the things that you're taking up day to day, I think, you know, I've certainly had portrait commissions where, um, you know, I go into it and I'm thinking like, how, you know, how am I going to make this something that is, is poetic and, but then it, then it evolves and something, you know, this, this painting uh, emerges that I, I'm really happy with that I'm really excited about. So, uh, you know, it's, you never can tell. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is gonna be a, maybe a, a funny question, but no as, I, I was, as I was scrolling through and, and looking at some of your different commissions on your website, mm-hmm. you know, before clicking on it and making it larger, looking at the thumbnail, I just assumed that you just had some reference photo- photographs in there. And then mm. scrolling through, I realized that, nope, they're all paintings. <laughs> uh-huh. Have you ever had an experience where a client um, was upset that it looked too real, like just like a photograph? <laughs> you know, um, no. I, <laughs> I mean, that would – I would have – you know, that, that would be interesting. Most of the time, the, the, the number one reaction I get to my work is, oh, it looks like a photograph. Yeah. And, and everybody means that as a compliment. Right, right. Would, you know, and I, and I understand that I take it that way because that's what, that's, you know, the general relationship people have with images. We're so inundated by photography. And so that's just kind of how we gauge reality. But there is definitely a difference between photography and, and painting. I mean, it's a big subject, but uh, not, to, not to sort of try to make a value statement. I'm just saying that there's a difference between, between the two. So, you know, but most of the time people have a, a kind of a photographic uh, memory of themselves, if that makes sense. Sure. So they actually, they like the photo, the photographed image. That, so, so that's what I'm kind of trying to battle with. How do I make something that, that feels like a painting, has that sort of timeless quality, rather than something that feels like a snapshot or something with a, with a really big grin or something and, and a pose that, somebody could never hold. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, you look at, you look at a Rembrandt and then of course he's, he's painting all these things from life because photography didn't exist. 
And so the, you know, the, the poses and things are fit together in a way that sometimes there's action. Sometimes there's all those, those different things, but it's, 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 it feels different than, than the action from the photograph. So anyway, it's a, that's something I'm often, I'm often uh, thinking about, but I've never had anybody say, uh, no, I could have just had a much. photographer do that. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> no. Um, and I, and I don't mean to belittle photographers either. <laughs> just to, no, yeah. Well, I, I wondered what is your relationship with classical realism and being a figurative painter? Um, you mentioned earlier, you're like, oh, I didn't even realize people still did this, you know, mm. does that ever frustrate you or does that, um, kind of embolden you maybe uh, like what's your relationship with the fact that you know it's not as popular because of mm. you know things change <laughs> and sure. uh, not as many people are interested in that not as many people are doing it um, how do you feel about that yeah I mean I think uh, there's frustration and excitement at the same time I think it's definitely there's there's been a resurgence of it in the last uh, I, I guess 30 years or so uh, there's so many more of those ateliers those those small schools um, that are popping up around the country and the world, and the internet ha- really provides such a an important platform for uh, awareness. You know, I can have anybody can have an Instagram account, and and people are on there and they're finding out about it. And um, you can even do teaching online, which is exciting. So that the the kind of just dissemination of these techniques uh, can just reach a really broad audience. So that's that's really really exciting. And then at the same time, it is a you know it is a little frustrating that that more people don't know about uh, about what it what it is and what it's doing that and it, there's there's complexity which is kind of the larger art market as well where the classical realism is still very much kind of a, a small niche of that uh, the the art market which is overwhelmingly more kind of contemporary based and and there's there's you know philosophical and ideological things going on um all over the place that that feed into that and those things can be frustrating when you know really what i'm what i'm excited about doing is just making this really beautiful painting with really high quality and it, you know it's just it's hard to have those are those are uh those are statements that seem obvious i think to the majority of people but in the art markets, it, there's there's all kinds of different ideas. I'm trying not to go down like that that uh, that rabbit hole. Right. If that makes sense, <laughs> yeah. what I'm trying to say. It that, does, yeah. Because um, I'm, you know, I, I just said beauty and then quality, and both of those things are you know have to be qualified, and we have to have these common definitions of it. And and you'll find in the art world that, that they aren't there, or at least they're they're hotly debated. So does that make sense? Is that kind of answering totally. your, yep, your totally. question? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, and well, kind of going along with the the idea of ateliers and and teaching, you mentioned that yeah. you you started teaching fairly soon after um, you started. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how early is it for somebody to consider starting to teach? Um, I'm I'm a big proponent that you know there's always going to be somebody that you could help. There's always going to be yeah. somebody that's you know further behind the journey than you, and it also I think you know very much helps an individual to be able to teach somebody else. So for, Most, for people yeah. that are listening, how soon is too soon? I know I'm right there with you. I, I think, uh, as soon, as soon as you feel comfortable, I, I, I don't think that there is a too soon, you know, I actually, I, I tried to introduce this in a workshop once it, 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 it didn't totally work just because of, I think that environment, but I do think in learning a skill, there's a saying it's see one, do one, teach one. Mm. Right? So, so see someone paint, then try to do it yourself, and then try to teach somebody else how to do that to do that skill. Because when you're when you're forced to verbalize something, when you're forced to kind of uh, think through the logical steps of it, you realize what you know, what you do know, and you realize what you don't know. And I really, and then it solidifies the 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 process in your mind or in your hand or whatever. So I, I learned a, a tremendous amount when I started teaching myself and. And there was a little bit of an overlap kind of at the end of, at the end of my studies, I was starting to teach some night classes and workshops and things like that. And, and I, I definitely saw kind of a, a leap in my, in my own work. So I, I can't recommend that, that highly enough. But how do you get past uh, imposter syndrome? Because I know just, mm. just to create art, uh, just to put yourself out there and, you know, to see something and then do something like you were saying that mm. um, sometimes requires 
uh, individuals to really push past that imposter syndrome. Like, who am I mm. to do this? But then you mm. get to that next step where it's like, okay, well, now who am I to like to teach this? You know, to to show mm. what I do or to like kind of um, elevate what I've done further past what it what it should be. When uh, you know, in reality, that that you have so much to teach, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just to, to identify that that that's a lie or something, you know, that because it's like you said, there's always somebody who doesn't know the skill that, you know, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, it can help them. It can get them further along and help you. I, I don't know. I was just thinking, I suppose you could, you could try to do it more at a peer level um, mm-hmm. with somebody else who's, who's at, try to teach each other this, this thing. So that you, then you're not feeling like, you know, you have to have this kind of like hierarchical thing. Um, but I, you know, I think that that's probably just, it's such an internal battle because I don't think it's your student that's going to feel that way. Um, and, uh, does that make sense? Yeah. You know, they're not looking for you to, um, to be this master anytime they're coming to you to learn something. So I think that that's just something to, it's like another one of those things, just take a deep breath and try to take that step forward. It might feel awkward, but I think it, I think it'll be beneficial in the end. Take that deep breath and just move on. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a very valuable technique. Just take a deep breath and go for it. So, yep. Uh, Joshua, it's time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them maybe your best final words of advice and encouragement and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Yeah, well, uh, it's it's something that I'm having to constantly um, just give my give myself that that same pep talk because it's it's hard. There's no there's no two two ways about it. It's difficult, but at the end of the day, life is difficult. I don't think it, you know whatever whatever path you choose, and so I would rather choose something that I'm passionate about, um, uh, at least to be a part of my life. You know, whether or not it's going to be your, your full-time career, but you just got to get going. You know, there's one saying I came across a number of years ago that the best time to plant an oak tree uh, was 40 years ago, <laughs> you know? but the next t- best time is as soon as you get home. And, you know, I just think that that's really true. You just, you've just got to go for it. You've got to start, start taking those steps. It, it could take a while and it could be difficult, but you know, the meaning, I think, that, that you get from it, the, the sense of, of purpose and engaging your heart is, uh, you know, there's, there's no substitute for it. So I love it. I'm, you know, there's, there's struggles and, and difficulties along the way, but I would definitely not choose anything else. So take that deep breath, take that step. So absolutely. Beautifully said. I love it. Joshua, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today, for uh, sharing your story, uh, sharing your insights, and, and giving us that push. I really appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Emily. Yep. And you can find Joshua on his website, joshualarock.com. On Instagram, he is Joshua Larock. We'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash Joshua Larock. Josh, thanks again. Thanks. Take care, young man. Love that guy. Huge thank you to Joshua for coming on the show. Uh, We talked about this recently on the podcast about teaching others, but I think this is a really good time to check in with yourself. And I asked you guys this question a long time ago, like, what unique things do you have inside of you that you can share with others? Or who is further behind on their journey that you can help to either inspire or to literally teach. It doesn't have to be in a formal setting, but who can you help um, on their journey? And like Joshua was talking about, sometimes it does take a certain pushing past that imposter syndrome. Like, who am I to teach others? But there's always something that you can teach to other people, even if it's just how you push past your own creative resistances and do the work every day. Or like I said, the technical side of things. And I love that idea of learn one, do one, teach one to really nail in these things that you are learning, these concepts that you are learning, these things, these new things that you are trying to do in your own creative process to not only learn it, to not only do it, but then to show others how you do it so that you can better learn it yourself. And I was just listening to a Tim Ferriss podcast episode, which I'll link in the show notes. And he was talking to Derek Sivers and somebody asked Derek, 
um, what success means. How do you know if you're successful or how can you define success? And he defined success as mastering yourself plus helping others. And it just fits so perfectly with what Joshua was talking about, even though it's more about mastering your life and uh, figuring out your own kind of emotional state. That's one thing. But then to help others, I think that's what we're all here to do. We get so much joy from doing that. And so often we don't put ourselves in the position to do it, to help others. So just, again, check in with yourself and think about how often you are actually helping others. And are there people in your life that you can share your gifts with, but also share your art with and share your inspiration with. It's not only going to help you be a better artist or a better creative person, but it's going to make you a better human. I promise you to be there face to face with other people and to share your joy for something and share your motivation, how you get to that thing. It can change the world and it will change the world. So think about how you can do that. Uh, But that's all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done and then to go and help others. So go and get that work done and go and help others. And we will see you next week if you need that push again. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done and we'll see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.